In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There are all sorts of ways that we connect. And those ways of connection keep changing. For example, Lori and I live in what, at least in Florida, is considered an older home. It was built in the early 60s. And sticking out of our house into the world from different little corners are little coaxial cables that used to connect to cable TV back when people did that. And when we first moved in and, and were working on the house, because we, it was a fixer-upper, which we realized once we moved into it, um, <laughs> on the baseboards were these little boxes that were meant for the, the uh, kind of early Ethernet connections of landline phones. We haven't had a landline since 1998. And then I'm often on my roof, probably more than I ought to be, uh, cleaning it, and there's a mount on my roof for a TV antenna, which we also don't use. We keep moving forward, or at least moving, in terms of how we connect. And yet more and more of us, more and more, social scientists tell us, actually feel disconnected. But we'll get back to that in a little bit. Today we celebrate a special feast, the Feast of St. Michael and all angels. And for some folks, angels fall into that category of coaxial cables and uh, dial-up modems and landline phones and antennas, meaning they're seen as ways of connecting with God that we no longer really need or use. After all, hasn't science and sciencey stuff done away with the need for angels? Well, as a scientist, I would say no, <laughs> not really. It's simply that, like important things like love or joy, the angelic is not something that can be measured. But if, as in today's lessons from Genesis and from John, which we'll talk a little bit about today, angels are means of connection, if angels are a way of bridging the space real or otherwise, between heaven and earth, between God and humanity, then angels are very, very real. I want to give you two phrases to associate with the idea of the angel. They both come out of uh, our parent Hebrew and Jewish traditions. The idea of a bat kol, which in Hebrew means the daughter of a voice is a way of describing God's word as we hear it. That message that is brought um, by the, the person of an angel, right? That we can hear in our heart or hear through another. Uh, that angelic voice that calls us to mission or that gives us comfort in a time of grief. Or when we think the world is just way too much for us, says, there's a lot more in you than you think there is. That's the daughter of a voice. That's part of the angelic tradition in Jewish religion. Another thing about angels is, at least early on in the Hebrew scriptures, in Genesis and other places, angels are called sons of God. Now that doesn't mean that they're God's kids, because God doesn't have a body and that would be weird. Um, but what it means is that angels bear the nature of God. Right, to be the son or daughter of someone in the ancient world meant that you, you, you wore their identity. You were just like them. And so the angels are, are the, the means by which we experience the nature of God. And there are stories of them all over Scripture. Jacob, Samuel, Mary, Jesus' mother, Joseph, all of them received God's call through the voice of an angel. And if we read those stories where angels show up in the scripture, we learn one primary thing, that when the angel talks, our job is to listen. No wonder so many people don't believe in angels anymore. We as a culture, I believe, have kind of lost our ability to listen. 
A little bit like Nathaniel in our story today. See, the folks who pick what we read sometimes leave out the more awkward parts. Do I have your interest now? Yeah, right? All right. So what is the awkward part, right? Right before Nathaniel shows up and says, Wow, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Philip says to Nathaniel, Come check out this guy, Jesus. We think he might be the Messiah. And Nathaniel says, He's from Nazareth. What good could come out of Nazareth? Right? Put in your least favorite town and fill in the blank, right? <laughs> Nathaniel was the kind of guy who thought he knew it all. If he knew where Jesus was from, and this was true in the ancient world, and knew his family, he would know everything about him. No surprises left. What Nathaniel had to learn, what all of us need to learn if we want to see the angels, is to learn to listen so we can listen to learn. So let's back up from Nathaniel for a minute and and go to this Jacob story that we begin our readings with. Jacob has this amazing experience. He's kind of on the run somewhere. If if you read a lot about him, he's either tricking someone or getting tricked, and he's always kind of running to or from somebody. And he lays down, he goes to sleep, and he has this amazing vision. He sees this connection between the worlds, right, like a ladder, and these angels coming up and down, right, all this communication. He sees how all is in communion, all is connected. In Christian terms, we would say how all is the body of Christ. He says, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. How often does that happen in our lives, right? Looking back, wow, the Lord was in this place, in this chapter of my life, in this hard thing. I didn't know it, but now I do. And so this nondescript place becomes, in Jacob's word, the house of God, the gate of heaven. And can't that be every place? Now let's go off book a little bit about Jacob here. There's another story about Jacob, and there's a reason I'm telling you this story, that he wrestles with what is called, uh, in the tradition at least, an angel. He wrestles with an unknown figure all night. And he doesn't lose, but he doesn't win. And he gets his his hip dislocated. And this angel, this being, blesses him and changes his name from Jacob, which means trickster, usurper, person of guile, to Israel, which at the time of Jesus was thought to mean one who sees God. We don't translate it that way today, but that's not, doesn't matter right now. So there's that Jacob story. So let's get back to Nathaniel. A lot of moving pieces. Everybody with me? Jacob, Nathaniel, angels. All right. Jesus calls some disciples with a miraculous catch of fish. He calls some disciples because they experience or are the recipient of a healing miracle. He calls some disciples because they see him turn water into wine. But in the case of Nathaniel, he calls a disciple with jokes and humor. We miss a lot of Jesus' humor. He was funny, right? And we miss a lot of Jesus' humor because we read it processing down an aisle in another language. If you've ever heard a comedian translated, if you've ever seen a comedian and had to read subtitles, it's not very funny. And so we miss Jesus' humor, right? But here's what he says. He says, here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Remember, Jacob meant guile. Right? That the word Jesus used here in Aramaic when he spoke this would have been related to the name Jacob. Here is an Israel in whom there is no Jacob. But they're the same person. So it's a play on words. And there's a second layer to the joke because Israel means one who sees God, but Nathaniel thinks he's seen everything he needs to see about Jesus. And so back in the day, this was really funny. <laughs> you had to be there, a geography joke, right? <laughs> It's an inside joke, but it was a funny joke at the time. And when Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree, that too has another meaning. It doesn't literally mean he saw him sitting under a fig tree. Being under the fig tree means being at home, being in your natural habitat, being yourself. So Jesus is really saying, I know you. I know who you are. He had met Nathaniel before. He knew him. Nathaniel forgot. 
you ever been in that awkward situation? Oh, I don't believe we've met. And the person says, sure we did. <laughs> 1978, French Riviera, whatever. This was Jesus and Nathaniel. He knew him already. And so Jesus is saying to Nathaniel in a poetic way, meant to draw on the Jacob story we hear, right? He follows up his joke by another reference to Jacob with the latter, that not only will Nathaniel realize that Jesus already has a connection with him, Nathaniel's going to realize if he sticks around, if he keeps showing up, if he walks in Jesus' footsteps, he's going to realize that it is through doing that, through having Jesus as his rabbi, that Jesus himself will be his connection that allows him to link all the worlds. Jesus himself is the connection between heaven and earth. So in angel language, the angels move up and down Jesus himself as the great tree of the world or as Jacob's ladder. Nathaniel will see how all is in communion, all is connected, all is the body of Christ. It's a pretty big promise. And we can read into that promise and think about it this way. If Jesus already knew Nathaniel under the fig tree, meaning he knows him in his natural habitat, he knows everything about him, and in spite of that welcomed him, because we're all off our guard in our natural habitat, right? Perhaps Jesus already knows each of us, too, in our natural habitat, in all the creases and recesses of our hearts, and welcomes each of us as well. And if Jesus promises Nathaniel that he will truly see the connections that his name as a true Israelite implies, perhaps Jesus is saying that you and I and each of us, too, can learn to see how all is in communion, all is connected. Perhaps we, too, can learn to listen to the angels. And if we listen, what are we going to hear? Let's turn to our reading from Revelation today. In this apocalyptic, poetic account of the struggle for good, for God's kingdom, we hear the story of how Michael and the angels, right, who represent this connectedness of all reality, has already defeated the devil to Satan, right? Two terms, uh, first in Greek, then in Persian, they both mean the accuser. Has defeated this one who accuses, right, who breaks connection. And we need to remember that what happens in the ancient world in heaven determines what happened on earth. So it's not like earth is here, heaven is there, and they each have their own deal. The heavenly realm informed what happened on earth. And so when we read this kind of story about this great serpent being thrown down to earth after being defeated from heaven, it doesn't mean that the earthly realm is the loser's corner in a heavenly battle. What it means is that the same victory of the angels, the same sense of communion, of connection, of community, has already been won here. That same vi victory of communion, of connection, of community, can already come to life more fully here and can never be vanquished. Because things that happen on earth happen as they do in heaven. We'll pray that in the Lord's Prayer in a few moments. And so what do we do with all this on our day-to-day -day concrete living? I think the main thing is to be like Nathaniel in this sense, that we need to put down our preconceived notions, put down our sense of already thinking we know it all and how everything works, and instead of saying, what good can come from Nazareth? Learn to listen, to experience awe and wonder, right? I think that's what it means to listen, so that we can listen to learn. In our age of ever-changing connection, we're often disconnected from the two realities that are our natural built-in power sources, God and nature. 
And we need them both. We see in the story of Jacob and in the call of Nathaniel the promise of a new connection, new communion with all of reality, the promise of an age of angels. And while our forms of outward connection continue to change and become more and more complex, I think we have two modems at home now, like now this white cube has shown up. I don't know how to use the white cube, but the the black tower no longer does anything, but there's a whole bunch of wires that at some point will disappear. As all these things change, we need to also remember, like Jacob and Nathaniel, how to plug in to what doesn't change. That connection between the heavenly and the earthly the deep communion that already exists among all of us and among the whole family of humanity and the whole ecosystem of the world. Let us, like Nathaniel, put down any been there, done that attitude to come to wonder, to experience awe in nature, to learn to listen so that we can listen to learn. The daughter of a voice speaks to us. The sons of God swirl around us. The ladder unfolds before us. As we engage our planet and her people, will we too be true Israelites, that is, those who see God?